welcome back to Disturbed Reality. Guerrero, once a state in Mexico renowned for its breathtaking views, from the scenic countryside mountains to the stunning coastal regions, as well as its culture and various tourist hotspots, most notably Acapulco. Once upon a time, Guerrero, and in particular Acapulco, was seen as the place to be. With its tropical climate and beautiful scenery, tourists from America and elsewhere, including the rich and famous, would flock to the area to soak up the sun and culture. However, in recent years, the state has been plagued by violence due to the infestation of various drug cartels in the region. The once tranquil mountains now run with blood, as the state plunges further into chaos and despair. Guerrero has always played its role in the drug trade, though in recent years, various cartels have been fighting to secure pieces of the lucrative land, mainly due to the fact that Guerrero is the leading state in Mexico when it comes to opium cultivation. Guerrero, due to being a large producer of heroin, also contains important drug corridors and state border crossings, which are imperative for drug cartels to control to ensure a smooth trafficking operation for their illegal narcotics. Worst of all, Guerrero is a state that isn't controlled by one cartel, and while on the surface this may seem like a good thing, it's actually the opposite. Usually, states or areas that are dominated by one singular cartel are actually less violent than those who are infested with various criminal gangs. Multiple cartels means that these groups are usually fighting amongst each other, drastically increasing the murder rate and crime rate in that specific area. And that is the case with Guerrero, with the state being considered to be one of the five most dangerous states in the country. It's estimated that there may be north of 150 separate criminal organisations operating in Guerrero, but most notably, CJNG, Guerrero's Unidos, La Nueva Familia Michoacana, Los Tlacos and Los Viagras have been blamed for much of the violence. CJNG most notably have been battling back and forth with La Nueva Familia Michoacana across the Tierra Caliente region, which also spans across Mexico State and Michoacan. The battles between both groups has produced unfathomable brutality, with both sides releasing brutal execution and propaganda videos relating to the conflict. Despite their might, power and resources, CJNG have not been able to displace the smaller cartels in the area, much like they have struggled in Michoacan. The fighting on the ground is akin to guerrilla warfare, and the native cartels who have a much better understanding of the landscape have managed to push back against CJNG's bid to control the state. One thing about CJNG that has led them to struggle in such scenarios is their lack of alliances with smaller, local cartels. However, in recent times there may be a change in strategy within the Jalisco-based crime group. Various news reports from Mexico in 2023 reported on a so-called truce and alliance between Los Viagras and CJNG, once sworn enemies. The authenticity of this claimed alliance is debatable, however. CJNG do, however, have a working relationship with one of the largest local cartels in the area, Guerreros Unidos. Guerreros Unidos are one of at least seven Beltran Labour Organization splinter groups that formed following the death of BLO leader Arturo Beltran Labour in 2009. The group was founded by Mario Salgado, aka El Sapo Guapo, who served as part of the BLO security team, and Cleo Tilde Toribio Renteria, aka El Tilde, who was a member of the hit squad of BLO operative Edgar Valdez Villarreal, aka La Barbie, along with several other former BLO bodyguards. Guerreros Unidos made their first public appearance in December of 2011 when the group claimed responsibility for a triple homicide in the state of Morelos. Over the following year, the Guerreros Unidos carried out several high-profile attacks, including a string of attacks on bars in Morelos 
that left 5 dead and 15 wounded. In December of 2012, the group also sent hitmen disguised as doctors to kill the leader of rival BLO splinter group Los Rojos while he was recovering from another assassination attempt in a hospital in Mexico City. As the years passed, Guerrero's Unidos rose in influence in the state, partly due to their partnership with CJNG as claimed in DEA documents. According to the DEA, Guerrero's Unidos is currently working with Cartel Jalisco New Generation, with whom they have partnered to control drug routes and have access to distribution networks in the United States, which is incredibly beneficial. Most notably, Guerrero's Unidos were responsible for the disappearance of 43 students in the state. Around 40 of the bodies are yet to be found, and only 3 were identified due to the discovery of burnt bone fragments. Though, we will cover the 43 missing students case in another video. Another gang in the area, who have been causing a ruckus, who haven't been in the news, go by the name of Guardia Guaranes, or in English, the Guerrero Guards. Guerrero, due to being a state decimated by drug cartels, has seen the rise in various vigilante groups, known in Mexico as autodefensas. The rise of autodefensas initially took off in the early 2000s in the state of Michoacán, primarily to fight back against Los Zetas, who started to infest the state. Over the years, more and more such groups have appeared across various states in Mexico, including Guerrero. As auto-defensor groups grew, it was hard to maintain a centralized group of leaders. Because of the lack of oversight of auto-defensor groups, these organizations began to be joined by former cartel members and people who felt above the law. One problem that the auto-defensor groups faced was a lack of resources, specifically guns. Originally, the weapons that auto-defensors managed to recover from skirmishes with cartels were sufficient to arm the vigilantes, though, as these groups got bigger, this no longer sufficed. In order to arm themselves, many auto-defensor groups began to sell drugs in order to buy weapons, essentially turning them into the very thing that they initially set out to combat. In fact, the most notable example of an auto-defensor group turning into a full-blown drug cartel would be Los Viagras. Los Viagras is led by one of the former leaders of an auto-defensor group, Nicolas Sierra Santana, who is also known as El Gordo. Los Viagras have been criticised by the government, as well as other cartels, for their brutal killings and general violence. The infamy of Los Viagras has made their leader, Nicolas Sierra Santana, one of the most wanted men in Mexico. As for the Guerrero Guards, they initially started under the guise of being a local defence group against the local drug cartels, primarily Los Viagras, in the Tierra Caliente region of Guerrero. It's speculated that the Guerrero Guards were actually funded by former and serving police officers, supposedly to protect local civilians against cartels. However, soon after their inception, it's said that they began running security for certain cartels in the area. It's said that the Guerrero Guards have a working relationship with CJNG, and ultimately, when such a group allies themselves with the likes of CJNG, they then become the target for other gangs. The Guerrero Guards are not necessarily big players in the state. However, most people who are interested in narco lure will be aware of the group due to one specific video, the Guerrero Flaying, also known as No Mercy in Mexico. The Guerrero Flaying is an 8 minute video detailing the murder of two captives by Los Viagras, the two captives allegedly being tied to the Guerrero guards. Some claim that the victims in the video are actually father and son, though this has yet to be confirmed. In the video, the older man is beaten and then beheaded in front of the younger man, as they force him to watch. The younger victim is then brutalised, he has the skin and flesh on his chest completely flayed, before having his heart ripped out as he is still alive. It's regarded as one of the most violent cartel videos ever to be released. 
In recent years, the guise of being a self-defense group has slipped, and the Guardia Guaranese are now considered as a small cartel. At the start of 2024, the group made headlines following a massacre in Patatlan, Guerrero, where 13 people were killed, including two minors. The violence was said to be a product of an internal squabble within the Guerrero Guards. The massacre was said to have been committed by gunmen in service of Edilberto Bravo Barragan, aka El Gavelan. Their attack was against Oliver Sanchez Correa, aka El Russo of Petatlan. Both are criminal leaders fighting for control within the Guerrero Guards. Regarding what happened, the Guerrero Prosecutor's Office reported that the armed attack had to do with the dispute between the two criminal operators, identified as El Gavalan and El Russo de Patalan. Alleged members of a criminal group led by a target that generates violence, identified as El Gavalan, arrived at the aforementioned venue, who according to evidence collected from testimonies, attacked with firearms against people who were members led by another criminal capo in the Costa Grande region, known as El Russo, detailed the prosecutor's office. El Gavalan is the alias used by Edilberto Bravo Barragan, who was born in a cradle of low-ranking soldiers who allegedly carried out torture and disappearances, according to reports by journalist Oscar Balderas of Milenio. It is presumed that his father had ties to the Sinaloa cartel, an organization to which he supplied marijuana. Barragan's first foray into criminal organizations was with Los Caballeros Templarios, the Knights Templars, a group with origins in the state of Michoacán. Their plans were to bring better quality marijuana seeds to Guerrero. But along with these activities, El Gavalan began to murder, kidnap and torture both police officers and enemies. After the disintegration of the Knights Templar cartel, El Gavalan managed to start his own criminal group called Guardia Guaranese, and for several years he operated freely, but in 2016 he was arrested by elements of the federal police in Petatlan as part of the investigations into the kidnapping of a local businessman. Barragan received a 50-year prison sentence, of which he only served six years. In September of 2022, he was released on the orders of Benjamin Galagos Segura, a magistrate of the State Superior Court of Justice. This was due to the fact that there were allegedly insufficient evidence to determine his responsibility for the crime. Just over a year later, El Gavalan perpetrated the first massacre in Mexico of 2024. It's unclear when the internal dispute within the Guerrero Guard started, though, as of right now, tensions are sky high. It's believed by some that El Galavan maintains support from CJNG, whereas El Russo does not. In fact, some rumours indicate that Oliver Sanchez Correa may be getting support from some within the Sinaloa cartel. Essentially, the Guerrero Guards, although operating under one name, have devolved into two separate factions, those loyal to El Russo and those loyal to El Gavalan. The massacre, in which took place on the 6th of January, was a sobering reminder that despite it being a new year, nothing really changes in the war on drugs. Following the massacre, naturally, those loyal to Oliver Sanchez Correa were looking to get even, and on the 16th of January 2024, a video was released in response to the massacre, and what was perpetrated on camera was nothing short of shocking. 2024's first quote-unquote cartel video is a brutal one. Following the massacre, El Russo's men assessed the situation and what went wrong, and they laid blame on a young man who had the position within the organization of a Halcon, which is a lookout. El Russo networked, and his men tracked down the young man, kidnapped him, and laid blame solely on him, insinuating that his incompetence led to the deaths that day, and informing him that his actions, or lack thereof, had to be punished. But nevertheless, what happens in the actual video?
The video itself is 2 minutes and 14 seconds in length, and it is shot during the day in a rural type location. The young captive can be seen sitting on the ground with his hands tied behind his back, and he is visibly scared, upset and traumatised by the situation in which he finds himself in. The first 40 seconds or so of the video, you see the captive cry as one of his captors lectures him on what he did wrong. The Sicario states the following, What should I say to all of those individuals, all of the families who lost relatives in that palenque? Should I tell them that I set you free because you cried before me? What should I tell them if I let you go? Those victims were either killed or maimed because of you. This is your fault. What should I say to all of those families affected by that massacre? What should I tell them? That they all died because of your actions. The young man can barely respond to the Sicario through the tears. It's really hard to watch. He apologises to no avail. Essentially, they blamed the victim for the massacre that happened on the 6th of January as he was a lookout in and around the event, and his failure to notify his superiors of what was about to happen was why he ended up in the situation in which he found himself in. I want to stress, the young man in the video wasn't a perpetrator in the massacre, just a supposed lookout. The position of being a Halcon or a lookout is one of the riskiest and the lowest paid in the cartel hierarchy. Such individuals frequent dangerous areas and report back to their superiors, informing them of the presence of police or rival cartels. However, usually they are unarmed and have no means to protect themselves, which means they are easy pickings for their rivals and in this case, his own employers. In fact, very often victims in violent cartel videos are very often low-ranking Halcones. After the interrogation section, which is around 40 seconds, the brutality then ensues. It seems that the execution segment isn't recorded in one sitting, though instead is a selection of clips detailing the murder. You see the victim laying on his back on the dirt floor. His shirt has been taken off, and the bottom of his jeans have been cut off. Above his knees, you already see that he sustained major injuries. He has two large gashes above both knees, and the victim writhes around on the ground in pain. The Sicario who lectured him can be heard giggling in a nonchalant manner as he looks on at the victim. A Sicario with an axe then chops away at the victim's legs above the knees, each time drawing an audible reaction from the victim. He screams out in pain after each blow. As the blade hits flesh, you hear the wet thudding sound, combined with the victim's groans. Though, he has already lost a lot of blood at this point, and you hear in his voice that he is very tired and weary. After the Sicario with the axe chops the victim's leg several times, he backs off, allowing the cameraman to focus on the victim, who at this point is taking hard and fast breaths. It looks as if he is hyperventilating. The noises he makes are also very disturbing. It's like snoring, mixed with grunting and groans. The Sicario then takes a machete and begins slicing the flesh above the victim's knees as the axe appears to have already broken the bone. The cameraman then changes position and you see that at least one of the victim's feet has also been cut off. The machete-wielding Sicario begins to hack away at the other leg, above the knee, though unlike the left leg, the bone hasn't actually been broken by the axe. You see a close-up as the man swings the machete into the wound already caused by the axe, and you hear a loud clanging noise as the blade hits bone. For some reason, this makes the cameraman giggle. Throughout, you still hear the victim snoring. He's drifting in and out of consciousness. The video then jump cuts to a previous scene in the execution. The victim is laying on his back, and you see that both of his feet have been cut off. The cameraman films a close-up of the victim's face, who just looks back at the camera with a vacant expression. The video then jump cuts once again. This time, you see the victim before he is killed. The victim's feet have been cut off, and his legs above the knees are being held on essentially by just the skin on the underside of his thighs. 
He has been completely butchered, but he is still alive. You hear him snoring. A man then roughly grabs him by the hair and drags him across the dirt ground into a freshly dug deep grave. This is where the video ends. So here we have it, the first cartel video of 2024, and let's be honest, there's going to be many more, which is the sad thing. Uh, explaining this video, I probably didn't do it justice how bad it is. The victim in this video was young, just a very low-ranking member of a organisation, and again, could he have prevented the massacre? I doubt it, but, you know, these organisations have to keep up appearances, um... And yeah, this is just one of those examples. It's a propaganda video, essentially. But it's bad, it's gruesome. And again, a lot of it was actually cut out. A lot of it wasn't recorded. So, yeah, uh, bad one. And obviously, to top it off, after all that torture, after all of that pain, uh, the young man was buried alive. So yeah, um, horrible video, without a doubt. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. If you're new here, hit subscribe. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, the link will be in the pinned comments. Also, the link to my Twitch will be in the pinned comments, uh, if you want to check that out as well. We've been having a good time on Twitch, actually. It's been fun. Uh, so if you want to check that out, look in the pinned comments. Links will be below. But anyway, as always, stay safe. And I'll catch you on the next one.